Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar entitled Musculoskeletal Ultrasound Evaluation, Differentiation of Tendinopathy versus Tear in the Rotator Cuff with Case Studies, presented by Dr. Colin Rigney. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. By the conclusion of this webinar, participants should be able to understand the terms high grade and low grade with respect to rotator cuff tendon pathology, be familiar with probe and patient positioning and image acquisition with respect to rotator cuff tendon evaluation, establish a working algorithm to recognize partial thickness tendon tears versus tendinopathy, and be familiar with tendon shape and echo textures that represent pathology associated with partial and full thickness rotator cuff tears. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Colin Rigney and Darcy Belito de Luna have no disclosures. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be able to access the CME test located on the AIUM website. Participants who complete the post test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. For more information on accessing the CME test and claiming credit, please refer to the handout provided in the dashboard on the right side of your screen. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. During today's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now I'm pleased to present Dr. Colin Rigney. Well, thanks, Darcy. And thanks for everybody um, who's choosing to spend um, this time on my discussion uh, today. This is a big topic and one that I've kind of take it on with the intent of maybe even having a follow-up to this. Um, so I, I hope that the objectives are fairly clear and I hope to be able to hit them all for you. If there's some clarification um, on your end, uh, I, I'll, I'll give out my email at the end and I'm totally open for for questions and consults. Um, this, is, this is something that that uh, was near and dear to me, um, I this, this topic that is. Um, I spend my weeks, uh, I'm a physical therapist by trade, but I spend my weeks doing musculoskeletal ultrasound full time. Um, I think since 2012, 2011, I've, I've counted my hard drive and there's, I've done over about 10,000 cases. Uh, so this is something I, I, you're still always learning, you you learn, when we talk about tears and tendinopathy, remember no two tears are really ever the same. Um, cases of tendinopathy are never, never quite the same. So it, 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 there's an art to this as much as a science, but um, we'll try to break it down into a working algorithm that, that if you're doing these in office that you can utilize. So with that said, let's dig in. Um, we're going to start with some relevant rotator cuff anatomy. I'd be remiss to go over this topic without covering basic anatomy of what what we are um, discussing. So anterior structures, keep in mind we have the bicep long head, uh, the subscapularis, the anterior deltoid, and the bicep short head. Now the bicep short head, um, you know, really there's minimal involvement here, but just understand that it's their relationship with the coracoid process. Um, it can easily be found with, with doing an anatomy scan. Um, rarely is it involved with, with the type of pathology we'll be discussing today. Um, our lateral structures, um, I, I just kind of group these generically um, just, just to go over everything we're going to be talking about. So we have the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, lateral deltoid, 
and the greater tuberosity um, with its facet superior, middle, and inferior. Um, so remember that the supraspinatus inserts to the superior facet and the infra is in uh, to the middle and inferior. So it actually overlaps that supraspinatus tendon. Um, you know, it, in practice, in reality, it, it's a fairly convex structure and I've never heard of a surgeon talking about the facets um, while they're in, in under our and when, when they're in the when they're in the scope it, it looks pretty convex and round when you're in there but I think for our purposes just know that that it exists um, because there's some cases where you see the infra coming over and overlapping the supraspinatus it's important to know that 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 could be what you're looking at sometimes um, in the posterior anatomy we have the infraspinatus uh, teres minor posterior deltoid the posterior glenoid labrum um, and also point out the teres minor, I, I, I have yet to encounter an isolated teres minor tear, I guess in a massive, massive rotator cuff tear where you have involvement of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and to the teres minor, and they're usually full thickness. Um, I, you know, but, but just understand that it's, it's not mentioned a whole lot, um, and its function really isn't isn't called upon um, unless there's compromise, a lot of compromise to the infraspinatus and supraspinatus, just so from a kinematic, on a kinematic level, um, that's that's basically what it is. So um, we're gonna get into patient positioning and imaging protocols. Um, so for the sake of today's talk, I'm leaving out um, a, a couple a couple different regions, but um, I utilize the, the European Society of Musculoskeletal Radiology protocol um, just because it's really accessible. I like their pictures. Um, it's, on, it's online. I have the link to it here. Um, the AIUM has protocols as well, and you can copy paste this link at the bottom. Um, the AIUM, uh, I, I believe, is in, in here in the States, um, is the governing body as far as who, who writes the billing codes and, and, and what stat, what um, what anatomic points satisfy a full study versus limited study. So the important thing is, is to pick one and learn it. Um, the European um, guidelines also, there, there's a lot of overlap with the AIUM. I think, I think when you look at the sequencing, the sequencing is a little different, um, but at the, at the end, um, all, all the, all the an anatomic points are, are pretty much the same. Okay. So, We'll get right in. Um, this is the modified CRAS position to identify the supraspinatus because remember, um, the supraspinatus is a little more anterior than than the infra and the teres. So to expose it from underneath the acromion, we need to put the shoulder in a degree of extension and internal rotation. Okay, so what you see here is the modified CRAS. Um, there's more than one way to do it. So see where the thumb is pointing. The thumb is pointing downward on this patient. You can also um, have the patient put the hand all the way back so their palm is facing the opposite direction of the sacrum, or you can have it so the thumb is facing kind of in line with the belt posteriorly. Um, you know, uh, whatever works for you, um, you should do one thing and stick with it so it's reliable. Um, but there are some cases where you need to kind of put the patient in modified and see if, if it's not too painful and get them into a full crass and establish, is there any change with what you're looking at when you do put it on more of a stretch? I mean, it's a valid question. So um, here's what I, and I got some pictures of what healthy should look like. So just so when we're looking at these cases, um, keep in mind what we have here. So um, from top to bottom, we have uh, the deltoid and you got the acromion, um, the, the arrow lines, the full arrow lines here um, are looking at the sub deltoid bursa. Uh, we have this clear, this is some anisotropy here. Anisotropy meaning um, the beam isn't quite fully 90 degrees to the, to the intended area. Okay, um, the asterisk establishes this is kind of the myotendon junction, so this is some supraspinatus muscle. And also remember too, so where I'm moving the cursor from, from this point is the proximal, or sorry, the, the distal um, articular margin of the humerus coming down. So this, we have some articular cartilage we're looking at here. And then from this area, this is the proximal footprint to the distal footprint. I, I believe the normal measurement from 
as I'm as I'm moving the cursor here on the greater tuberosity is about 10 to 15 millimeters. I think that's a that's a that's the normal range that you'll find most footprint widths. Okay, so and also recall that the supraspinatus um, attaches to the superior facet on the greater tuberosity. So there's a short axis view of the supraspinatus tendon. And again, so the corresponding arrows, so our articular cartilage. Okay, so we're looking at the humerus in a, in a cross section or a, the short axis view. Okay, supraspinatus tendon as it's labeled. Got over here, this is the bicep tendon. Okay, and just medial to it will be the subscapularis. All right, and we have the deltoid superficial to the tendon, as well as the full arrow here representing the subdeltoid bursal line. Okay, so patient positioning for the infraspinatus. Um, notice how to, for all these positions, we like to put the, the tendon on a degree of a stretch. So we have um, adduction and internal rotation to kind of put the put the infraspinatus on a stretch. Um, there's multiple ways to do it. You can have them grab their other arm. I typically, if it's not too painful, have them reach for their other thigh. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Whatever is going to work for you with that patient um, on that day typically is what I choose. It's never, it's never usually one position. Okay, so this is kind of a panorama view that the, I pulled from the European guidelines that they, that they utilize. Um, so, Humeral head. Um, this is a long axis view of, this, of the infraspinatus. Okay, so distal is to the left, proximal is to the right. Um, superficially, we have the skin layer, the deltoid, and um, the kind of some uh, bursal line of the subdeltoid bursa, and then the infraspinatus and the humeral head, and the inferior, uh, middle inferior facet. Okay, and again, subscapularis. Um, we do have some have some interesting subscap cases today as well. So I think that you guys will find this interesting. Um, so patient positioning to view the subscap. Remember, we need to expose it from underneath the coracoid, so it needs to be stretched in an externally rotated position. Um, this is a position sometimes with patients can be difficult if there's a degree of of adhesive capsulitis. Um, oftentimes, your viewing window is going to be limited because they just can't stretch. So keep that in mind and do the best you can. You have to work with the patient sometimes and, and, just, and just acquire what you can to get some kind of diagnostic value out of the image. So this is a, this is a short axis view. So sorry, this, is a, this, this position here, um, the way the probe is long axis and I, we're going into a short axis view, so I want you to understand that. Um, um, a healthy short axis view of the subscap tendon is will look like this. Remember, it's a multi-pennate muscle, so when it forms into the tendon, it has these kind of multi-pennate structures, kind of like the tricep does, um, where we have these tendon bundles in interposed our muscle. So just know that these aren't calcifications or abnormalities. Um, this is a normal picture of the subscap tendon. In a long axis view of the subscap, um, this line represents the upper border footprint of it. Um, remember, the, the, the footprint of the subscap is quite large. It's about five centimeters, um, you know, as opposed to the supraspinatus, which is about one and a half at the, at the, at the largest, maybe, maybe two. I don't know um, that the orthopedic surgeons would, would probably um, give you a, a more, I, I think 10 to 15 millimeters, as I stated, was, is a is a good range so just just know that it's a big footprint okay so we're when we're looking at most tears in the subscap 95 percent of them are going to be at the upper border all right and then so as we come just laterally um, we have the bicipital groove so just understand the relationship is because we're going to get into some cases where these relationships kind of diverge with each other or converge i should say so um for clinicians out there, so accuracy of manual muscle tests or manual muscle or manual tests, manual special testing for prediction of rotator cuff tear. Um, we're going to compare these against against imaging values. So our empty can um, for empty can test for a partial thickness rotator cuff tear has a fairly low sensitivity, um, kind of moderately high specificity, and a full thickness slightly better for each. 
Um, the drop arm test, partial thickness, very low sensitivity, fairly decent specificity, not quite 80%. Uh, and drop arm full thickness is uh, 0.35 sensitivity and a fairly high specificity. And our painful arc sign for any tear is is a has a high sensitivity and low specificity. So just for just for reference sake, remember sensitivity helps rule out a disease when the result is negative. And specificity, if the test result is positive, you can be nearly certain that they actually have the tear or the disease, whatever you want to apply these um, these rules to. All right, so um, MR arthrogram versus MSK ultrasound versus MRI non-contrast, okay? So comparing um, the sensitivity and specificity of uh, an arthrogram, which is, you know, I think in if you were to, five, 10 years ago, which would probably be considered the gold standard. I think now I mean, MSK ultrasound is right there with it as the training and the saturation rate of good users and good operators has gone up. Um, we've seen the sensitivity, we've seen the results become more accurate and more in line with that of the MRI with ultrasound and rotator cuff pathology. So um, this is for your reference. I, I don't feel the need to go point by point with it. I think just understand that any tear with an MR arthrogram um, has a 0.92 sensitivity, 0.97 specificity, and MSK ultrasound, any tear, 0.85 sensitivity, 0.92 specificity, okay? Um, partial thickness, just keep in mind for our partial thickness tears, does require a little more of an experienced hand um, to to the, the, the little more, the, the, you know, as the as the data uh, suggests, um, more of it's missed. Um, but I I would argue that with with uh, with a experienced user, experienced operator, I would put it as good or better than an MR arthrogram. So 0.86, I I would be willing to bet we're probably about 90% sensitivity, at least it was with my in in my opinion in my practice um, anecdotally, I, I would I would I would put the number there. Um, and then non-contrast MRI. So look at look at how it drops. Okay, so we're right in line, at least in in this in this with this data that, that's that's on the screen. Okay, so partial partial ultrasound 0.67, partial MRI non-contrast 0.64 for partial tears. Okay, um, versus 0.93 and 0.92. So um, we're starting to get some equivocal data points here. All right, um, so. Part of the working algorithm, I, I think that 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 I, we're starting to get into here for ultrasound and partial thickness tears, okay, or any tears for that matter. If you if you see a degree of intraarticular fluid and subacromial subdeltoid bursal effusion, um, these in and of themselves, these data points don't mean a whole lot. Um, you see, they have a high specificity on their own, but when you combine the two of them. Um, if you see both in the same study, okay, you're fairly certain something's going on and you better find it, okay? So if these both of these are positive, remember high specificity means if both these are positive, that they're nearly certain there's some sort of tear and you need to find it, okay? So just understand that. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you're learning and you're just starting out, um, I, would, I would save these data points and, and just kind of know that going forward, okay? Um, greater tuberosity irregularities. Um, again, you know, when you see these types of irregularities, um, high sensitivity, high specificity, so we're about 90% for each, okay? And so, and again, when you combine the greater tuberosity and interarticular fluid, um, it's near 100% for something going on, okay? So, um, the greater tuberosity irregularities can vary, okay? Remember, we're on a spectrum here, so the types of greater tuberosity um, irregularities I hope to be able to, to describe some of that to you today. Okay, so um, remember that the word, rotator cuff is a disease on a spectrum. So it exists along a spectrum, meaning that on one end are healthy tendon fibers that begin to change from mild, uh, mild tendinopathy, mild tendinitis, and bursitis in the cuff to severe full thickness cuff tearing, and you have everything in between, okay? Um, Evaluation and diagnosis is then focused on figuring out if there is rotator cuff disease and where it, and where on the spectrum it lies. 
And that's where ultrasound is, in my opinion, is a superior tool. Um, so kind of piggybacking on the last webinar we had on ultrasound and tendinopathy. Um, so specifically today, we're talking about the rotator cuff. Um, tendinopathic findings are, are generally associated with tendon thickening, hypoechoic clefting with patchy and linear areas of more pronounced hypoechogenicity. All right. So what, what that means is, you know, you have some focal regions of tendinopathy without, um, maybe there's some linear tears in there that don't, that don't extend through the whole tissue. Um, that's, that's technically graded as tendinopathy. Um, so the average rotator cuff tendon thickness has a median of six millimeters with a normal range between four and 6.9, um, taken from the reference on the bottom. Um, you know, we grade tendinopathy, um, at least in my practice, um, we grade it arbitrarily and subjectively as mild, moderate, or severe based on the, on the degree of thickening, hypoechogenicity, and loss of normal, of fib, normal fibular pattern. And this is, of course, there is an absence of a combination of intraarticular fluid, uh, subdeltoid effusion, and that sort of thing. Um, so hypoechoic clefting are areas of proteoglycan de deposition um, on, the, on the histologic level. Um, sometimes these are difficult to distinguish from intersubstance tears, and this is where the experience comes in. Um, I think just to be able to, if you're just starting out your practice, you, you, you just wanna be able to identify it, okay, and then find it in two planes. Um, and then, and then look for the other factors of the fluid. Maybe there's retraction somewhere if you need to move the, move the patient dynamically to, to elicit those tears, um, that can be done as well. Um, so, you know, the dynamic is sometimes a tendon just at rest looks healthy, looks fine. Um, it looks like it has a full volume, but then you start to move it and all of a sudden um, you see one tendon move one way, the bone moves the other way, and then all of a sudden, well, that looks like something's not right there. The tendon should move when the bone moves, but it's moving the opposite way. Um, and that could be an indicator that there's something more, okay? So tearing beyond that of tendinopathy is more consistent with linear, more hypoechoic, and sharper in outline. Um, those, that's more of a tear versus tendinopathy, and may or may not be associated with changes in surface contour of the tendon, depending on how acute, how acute the injury is. Um, sonographic findings of rotator cuff tendinopathy. Um, tendinosis generally affects all rotator cuff tendons to some degree with the supraspinatus being most affected, okay? Um, ultrasound allows you to compare both sides quickly if, if, there's a, if there's a question, but also understand that tendinopathy is very common just in asymptomatic individuals. So keep in mind their other tendon, their other shoulder, the uninvolved side may look similar, okay? So don't be surprised when you see that. Um, Tendon hyperemia is fairly rare. I've, I've seen it a few times, but in most cases of, of rotator cuff tendinopathy, um, you won't see much vascularity or, or hyperemia in the tendon. Um, it's much less common in the rotator cuff than in other sites um, like the Achilles tendon, posterior tibialis, or the patellar tendon. Okay, so sonographic appearance of rotator cuff tears um, and ruptures. Um, so that, that description I was talking about, uh, the paradox of movement, that's an ism of a physician I work with, I've kind of picked it up and utilized it for myself because I, I think it represents, um, that represents a high grade tear. If you're able to elicit, elicit a, a contraction where the bone, your, the bone moves one way, the tendon moves the other way, that's paradoxic movement. That, that is, that's a tear and you need to dig more into that and investigate where's it coming from. Um, the deltoid herniation sign. Okay, so these are these are just indirect signs that something is going on. When you combine them all together, um, you have a very powerful study. So the deltoid herniation sign, it may be synonymous with the paradox of movement. So when the ten, when you see the tendon retract, this is a dynamic. Um, it's a dynamic sign, the deltoid herniation sign. Um, when you see the tendon retract, you'll see this uh, the deltoid drop into the space of the rotator cuff where the retraction happened. If that makes sense, I have a couple video examples that will become um, um, you, you, you can synergize with this slide. OK, and then distinct fiber separation, just um, just reiterating what paradox movement retraction. So rupture with retraction can be evaluated by the level of retraction off the footprint, either by objectively measuring um, the caliper 
or subjectively with describing where the retraction is, um, like retraction off of the anatomic footprint or proximally located at the um, articular margin or it's retracted all the way back to the glenoid. Um, those are ways of describing where the retraction is and I think it's, it's valuable with um, care planning for that patient. As well as I want to point out um, looking at um, the, the fossas, so the supraspinous and infraspinous fossa uh, as well. So when you encounter a rotator cuff tear, I think it's important to um, look at the infraspin infraspinatus teres minor musculature as well as the supras supraspinatus muscle um, proximally in the fossa and just get an idea for um, how they look. Do they look like a healthy starry night pattern or is fat atrophy starting to set in? Um, you can compare that with the other side if there's a question, um, and that will help you grade it as well. I think this is a case I've started. I, I haven't done I haven't done um, measurements like um, in in the fossa very consistently, with the exception of the past maybe year year and a half. It's been more of a, more of a regular thing in my studies, and, and I think it's valuable, especially when you encounter tears. Um, what I have found is this is an example of so say in your in your affected shoulder you look at the, the infraspinatus and supraspinatus, you see a lot of fat atrophy in there. Um, there's decreased echo texture, it's kind of gray and, 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 and just kind of a smaller volume. Um, look at the other side that's not involved, and this is if they don't have a tear on that side. Um, typically, it will look different. Um, so that, that's at least that's my anecdotal evidence and my, my opinion. Um, that may not always be the case when you get out there, but just understand just understand that that's available to you with ultrasound. It's quick and easy to do. Um, some more signs. So chron chronic degenerative tears, ruptures, typically have significant cortical irregular, uh, irregularities at the greater tuberosity and anatomic footprint um, compared to acute ruptures that do, you know, I, so say you get a patient who's five to seven days post mechanism of injury, who doesn't have, who had not really a prior history of shoulder issues. Um, sometimes they, they often, actually it's not sometimes, they often don't have cortical irregularities to look at, okay? So just understand the two. All right, so getting into, um, so supraspinatus, this is a supraspinatus term with some early tendinopathic changes. Okay, so where the, where the arrows are signify what I'm talking about here. So. Um, you have a small calcification here, coupled with, coupled with kind of a, 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 a hypoechoic focus zone within the tendon here, a mid-substance tendinopathy, another, another focal tendinopathy here, as well as over at the distal side. Um, you know, nothing here suggests that there is a massive tear, at least on this static picture, but these are signs that are all consistent with tendinopathy. Okay, so getting into kind of a more affected shoulder here, um, I think, uh, I believe with this patient, we had the MRI first, or no, sorry, the ultrasound was done first. Um, and I, we were on the fence about it. I was on the fence about it. Um, just, just by looking at it, we couldn't really elicit a contraction. I don't have a movie with this one, um, but just looking at this, we have the bursal. So we have the, so in long axis on the bottom here, we have the bursal fibers appearing to be tacked, in, intact on top. Um, these might be some infraspinatus fibers coming all the way over as well, um, and then the bursa on the top, okay? But whether or not it's the supraspinatus or the infra, these are intact fibers compared to the deeper fibers along the footprint and back. Um, these definitely look um, suspect, okay? And then, and then we have the corresponding image here. So you have this cortical irregularity, that signifies where this is. Look at how much involvement of the tendon in there is. Um, the MRI came back equally as vague um, as as you noted here. Um, the patient did end up going for orthopedic consult and elected to have surgery, and there was a definitive partial thickness undersurface articular tear. Okay, so um, this is this is what the case turned out to be. Um, the bursal fibers of supraspinatus and the infraspinatus were grossly intact. So I, I believe the infraspinatus articular fibers were involved in this particular case. Again, um, here's another one. So this one is a little, this, there's no, not as many question marks with this one. This is a tear. 
um, by ultrasound standards and I think MRI standards as well. I don't think the patient had an MRI with this one, but some characteristics that I already I, that I went over earlier that I want to show you are look at the level of look at the level of cortical uh, um, uh, pathology here. So see how this is like a rim rent sign, meaning that that there's no footprint, there's no viable footprint here for the tendon to attach to. Okay, and look at we have this in long axis. We have a slight little deltoid herniation sign at the level of the footprint, which is where you'll find most deltoid herniation signs is at the level of the footprint. Remember, the footprint where the calipers are shows what's affected. So it's about seven uh, seven point or uh, 0.75 centimeters um, versus uh, short axis where you have it's a little more prominent. OK, but you should be able to see the delta herniation sign in two planes. OK, um, as well as at this level of uh, cortical irregularity. So um, we can be fairly certain that the tear originated at the footprint at this level. Um, and then the next step would be so we know the supraspinatus has a pretty much a full thickness tear or close to it. Um, the next step would be looking at see if the infraspinatus is involved. OK, but for this case, I think this is a good one to show um, that, you know, what a cuff tear looks like, what a high grade, large articular surface tear is. OK. OK, so another one here. All right. Um, this one was an interesting one because this is a fairly young patient who came to see us. Um, uh, a high level athlete, a, a, a really high level athlete coming in. 18 years old with shoulder pain and had been going on a while um, and put the probe on this kid and look at what he has. I mean, this is a no brainer. So you see a lot of the same, a lot of the same um, features as the previous patient. However, because the, the kid is so fit and healthy and he's a really an elite athlete, look at how the tendon keeps his volume. We don't have the deltoid herniation sign here, but I, I think because he's so compensated, you know, he's pretty strong. He's got some strong upper traps and deltoids and a lot of other features that that maintain what a what a tendon should look like however look at the sign here look at this degree of, of cortical irregularity now the footprint defect is a little more proximal and involves the distal portion of the articular um, uh, articular margin on the humerus okay so this whole area the tendon is retracted basically from where you see the defect to where i'm moving the cursor okay so we can take an objective measurement there um, and we see that the, these fibers, be it um, supraspinatus, bursal fibers, uh, or these might be infra, some, uh, just based on the view we're in, you can catch some of the infra fibers coming over. I used to fool myself a lot. I think I was looking at some infraspinatus fibers coming over, or super, I thought I was looking at supraspinatus when in fact they were really infraspinatus. Um, but this is a very straightforward case. Now, this was also a case where I couldn't elicit a, a frank retraction, so I couldn't get that paradoxic movement to come in. Um, I think some theories for that are um, this: the intact bursal fibers sometimes act as a tether, meaning when you go to contract, these fibers that are still intact are actually keeping these locked down, um, keeping the deeper fibers locked down, preventing a, a retraction when you go to um, elicit that movement. So. Just, just one theory to to throw out there. I, I think it's real um, because not all cases are textbook, nice and clean. I mean, remember, no two tears are the same. Every patient's different. So, you know, as much as as much as you'd like to see that all these signs add up, um, like and make it for an easy study, um, that's quite quite often not the case. Um, at the bottom, just keep in mind what the the rim rent sign. I think I pulled this off of. Uh, uh, radiopedia.com with the with this particular um, reference um, just just to describe what we're looking at here um, here's an old here's a patient who comes in with chronic shoulder pain um, I you know this is a case where you, you just looking at it you know that I think this is a little beyond what tendinosis is um, meaning Look at the degree of flattening we have with these bursal fibers um, and how in this long axis view, you have this hypoechoic cleft surrounding this, this stub that's left at the articular footprint. Um, this doesn't appear to be attached, whoops, doesn't appear to be attached to anything anymore here. Um, 
and it corresponds with a short axis view of at the same level we have a uh, cartilage interface sign um, usually it's this is a sign that's best seen in short axis that, that corresponds with some sort of rotator cuff tear but also keep in mind that the cartilage interface sign um, <clears throat> has a fairly low sensitivity again meaning that sen uh, sensitivity helps rule out the disease so if it's low we're not necessarily getting that with the just the cartilage interface sign in and of itself but it has a high specificity so just keep in mind that when you see that there that's that's when you see the cartilage interface sign it's not associated with typically healthy tendons okay but it doesn't always mean they they have a massive tear okay but with this patient see the short axis view of um <clears throat> we have the bicep tendon uh, bottom left and then these defects um adjacent to what i believe is a stub here okay so this is the corresponding so I, I think that they had a big tear that probably left a little off of the articular side um and the mri confirmed what we what we kind of thought there's an incomplete supraspinatus tear um and again again i I'm, I'm paraphrasing this but it was a fairly vague read which is um you know i with a lot of the doctors i work with um we don't always get it, depending on the level of, of, of uh, evidence we find with, with the ultrasound doesn't always mean we're going to order an MRI, but in this case, um, it corresponded with what our initial findings were. So fat atrophy, um, this is coming back in the, in the, in the posterior uh, infraspinous fossa. Okay, so um, we have the teres minor and short axis, relatively healthy and untouched, and then adjacent to it, the infraspinatus, um, this is an easy one to look at, even if you don't know ultrasound. Look at the contrast, okay? Um, you got a lot of just kind of scarry, fatty infiltrate here, decreased echo texture. We don't see the fibro adipose that's very, should be echogenic, as you see in the teres minor. Um, this is a textbook example, okay, of a grade two, three fat atrophy. Um, this is a patient who had a massive, massive uh, type three tear of supraspinatus that also involved the infraspinatus articular. All right, um, here's a case of, of uh, what turned out to be a severe case of tendinopathy, okay? So look at the level of cortical irregularities. We don't see quite the rim rent defects, the articular side defects that we saw in the previous cases, okay? But this is what probably the next stage would be, would be to have a defect like that as this shoulder progresses that would likely be the next step in disease. So this is a severe case of tendinopathy at the articular side. I don't recall if we got an MRI on this one or not, but I think that, I think the patient um, did resolve with conservative uh, management, okay? But see the evidence is here. We have a lot of thickening of the bursa, okay? We have thickening of the tendon itself. The, the level of cortical irregularity here that doesn't seem to represent a break or a rim rent Okay, it's still continuous with each other, but we have these irregularities here that suggests that that there's there's they're kind of at the moderate to severe side of tendinosis. Okay, here's an acute rupture. Um, this patient was I think four days post injury when we saw her. Note how the cortical surface of of the footprint is nice and smooth. Okay, we have a rupture. This is the this is the bulbous edge of the retracted there's the or the retracted edge of the tendon. Okay, so we have a what is this 0.89 centimeters retracted here. Um, compared with the short axis view, um, just taking a just taking a, a caliper of the defect for the for the surgeon. Um, this was a no brainer. Um, her 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 physical signs lined up exactly with the mechanism, which lined up exactly with the uh, rotator cuff tear, and and she went to surgery. Um, I think a couple weeks later. So in contrast, this is a full thickness tear, okay? Uh, so we have a supraspinatus here. The articular margin basically it starts about right here. So when you have these full thickness tears, um, a lot of your landmarks don't, don't look the same, okay? Because, because this is such a chronically, um, chronically involved shoulder. Basically from where the cursor is here to here, this was the footprint. And we see the, the retracted edge is all the way back here. Um, to the articular margin. So this is a case of this retracted to the articular margin. We have the deltoid falling into the space left by where the rotator cuff used to be. We have the subdeltoid bursa 
where I'm moving the cursor here. All right, and we have these quarter levels of cortical irregularity. Um, when you put the probe on and you see this, you know, it, it takes 30 seconds to figure out that they have a full thickness tear. Um, here's a movie of, of a chronic tear that's degenerative in nature. Okay, so I'll just play it. Um, so you see this movement here. This isn't super clear, but but you see this triangular edge. This is the bulbous edge of the retracted tendon away from the footprint. I'll play it again. Okay, and when you, I'm having the patient kind of con, do an isometric um, abduction against me in the crasp, in the modified crasp position. Okay, you see the you see the deltoid open or the deltoid burst, the subdeltoid burst open up a little bit. You can make an argument. Maybe there's some bursal fibers intact. Um, maybe this is some infraspin uh, infraspinatus fibers I'm catching in that particular view, kind of coming over the top um, that are still intact. But for the most part, this 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 is what represents a full tear. Um, you see the humerus moving, and then this edge is not moving. Um, that's that's a giveaway. Um, good example of a deltoid herniation sign. So this is a supraspinatus tendon um, with an isometric contraction. Watch where the arrow is, and you'll you'll see it here when you have the patient contract, deltoid drops in. Um, you don't get this type of sign without there being a, a, a high-grade tear. Now, it doesn't look like you – know, we can make an argument, but there's only one view in this picture. Um, make an argument that this is a big intersubstance tear because look at this. It looks like the footprint is relatively untouched. Um, Compared to uh, compared to the, the middle area and bursal side, okay, we'll play it again. Now, honestly, I can't recall if this was an articular uh, sided tear, but this was a fairly um, uh, when we examined this person, um, it was it was a pretty acute situation. I think um, it was about seven days out. So he, he fell and reached to a handrail to prevent himself from, uh, uh, prevent prevent himself from falling. You know, and so know how the footprint is pretty clean. But when you see this, like when you see this sign here, this herniation sign drop in with the contraction, um, that that's that's definitely a high grade signal. OK, so a partial thickness, supraspinatus tear again, just to hammer this home. <clears throat> the rim rent sign, see how there's no continuation of cortical outline here. We have a complete void here and then adjacent to that void is this hypoechoic region of tendon um, we can we can definitely surmise if you did a caliper from where my arrow is to this bundle this is you know and roughly we'll say roughly this is where the tendon retracted to possibly maybe further back I don't know um, but you know as I as I noted in the text um, this is a distinct case um, versus tendinopathy and partial thickness tear because we have bursal fibers coming over the top it does not by by definition represent a full thickness tear um, but it is a straightforward case all right so just now we're getting into um, a couple um, a couple other cases this is an infraspinatus so we're at the level of the posterior joint so we have the posterior rim of the glenoid to the right Okay, and then distal is to the left, and this is the humeral head. I want you to keep your eyes focused in this region um, right where the arrow is. And you'll see when the, the humerus moves, see how it keeps moving? And then all of a sudden the tendon stopped. Okay, see this bulbous edge right here? Okay, that's, that's a retraction of the infraspinatus. Okay, so um, this is one example of the infraspinatus and one example of what represents a tear versus tendinopathy. Um, typically, you don't see these infraspinatus tears in isolation. Most likely, it originated anteriorly at the supraspinatus, but it progressed enough to affect the infraspinatus, and this was an additional sign that we encountered. Okay, so as you see the paradox of movement, when the humerus moves and you see the tendon not move with it, um, that that's 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 a sign of, of a high high grade tear. Okay, and the subscapularis. So just a just a little outline here. Um, this is a good schematic of the lesser tuberosity. Okay, where the asterisk is um, and the dotted line. This is where most of your tears occur. The upper border insertion of the subscapularis. Okay, and then we have these levels of um, from uh, cranial to caudal. Um, 
where the tendon inserts and then but the bottom is actually I think a more a muscular attachment um, I haven't heard of any cases of a full thickness subscapularis tear um, I don't know the, the biggest ones you'll see are generally around two or three centimeters and this is a five centimeter footprint from from top to bottom so again keep that in mind all right so this is a case um, I, I, yeah, I always start my cases with looking at the bicep first um, because that's the window to the shoulder. If you see a lot of fluid in the bicipital sheath, typically that's synonymous with some sort of intraarticular fluid or, or inflammation and it's there for a reason, be it a massive cuff tear or if it's just bicipital tenosynovitis, it's there for a reason. So in this case, I put it on the bicipital groove and there was no bicep. Okay, so I'm like, what the heck? Okay, so you kind of move around and then, whoa, it's over here. Okay, so this is a case where the bicep dislocated over the lesser tuberosity. Um, the reason for this slide um, prior is just to just to note that um, that understand that the coracohumeral interval or the coracohumeral sling, the rotator cuff interval and its contents. Um, which is basically a topic for a whole separate lecture. But just know that, that the, those structures, the superior glenohumeral ligament, the transverse ligament of the bicipital groove, then the coracohumeral sling kind of make a stabilizing force between um, the, the bicipital groove and the lesser tuberosity. So when you see this and the bicep has moved over, by default, it had to have interrupted that complex, okay? So just know that. Um, when you see a bicep dislocation like this, that there, there's most likely is an upper border subscap tear, and it did interrupt that that the rotator cuff interval, the coracohumeral sling. Okay, um, I was moving this, I was moving this really fast to see if the bicep tendon would dislocate, and it did not. Um, it turned out the bicep was intact. I, I, the story I got from the surgeon was um, it was intact, and I think when they went to position for surgery, it, it relocated. Um, but he ended up doing a tenodesis, and this gal was just in, she was in so much pain. I remember when we first saw her, um, and it, something, you, you knew something was there and you had to find it, but it turns out she also had a rotator cuff tear, the supraspinatus as well. So she had a, she had quite a bit done. Um, and um, I don't remember the injury mechanism um, right off the top of my head, but it was a, it was obviously something pretty, pretty big. All right, another uh, bicep, and this one isn't quite as clear, okay, but um, just to the left is distal, right is proximal, and we have the subscap tendon, okay, there's a bicep dislocation right here. Um, I want you to keep your eyes focused in this region as I play. Um, watch how this kind of, this, this area is kind of floating in the wind. It's like a flag flopping in the wind a little bit. So you have some, you have some deltoid herniation there. Okay, so, but when you have the bicep dislocate over here, again, just to make the just to draw the point home, um, um, by default, just by it being there and not and not 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 relocating back, it had to have interrupted um, the stability of the subscapularis and the coracohumeral sling, rotator cuff interval, etc. Okay, and so here's a kind of more example that's in line with tendinosis. Okay, of the subscapularis. Notice how the rest of the tendon is very fibrillar and echogenic. Okay, compared with the distal insertion. You see a lot of tendinopathies at this area on, on the subscapularis. Okay, and then some examples of like severe uh, tendinosis that, that's, that are this calcific in nature, okay? Um, just got a few minutes here and then we're gonna get through these calcif um, a few calcification studies and then hopefully get to questions. Um, we have, I believe this is short axis down here. Yeah, it's labeled short axis. So see this calcification, how this shadows a lot of the footprint. Um, it makes it, it makes evaluating the whole tendon hard because you can't you just can't see what's underneath it because the sound waves don't penetrate the calcification. The best you can do is just kind of take measurements here, and 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 just identify the as best you can in, in three in three dimensions um, or in two dimensions. I identify you know and evaluate the the deposition inevitably there's going to be some fraying okay it's like a rope over a rock and the longer it's there the, and you try to move that tendon you try to move your arm you're just gonna fray that thing little by little every time 
Okay, here's another one. These are mature um, calcific depositions. And again, here, um, you can make the argument this this could be a rim rent sign in the long axis. Now, I didn't I didn't exactly um, identify it in two planes, but I was focusing on the calcific um, deposit here. Now you can see this is pretty big, one centimeter by 0.87 centimeters. Um, there are there are ways to intervene conservatively, um, which is a topic for another another time. But but evaluating these are very easy with the with the ultrasound. And again, another mature linear calcification in the supraspinatus. You know we see the footprint is irregular, um, but there's no breaks in the cortex. We have the rest of the tendon is fairly, now notice in this one too, it's just interesting. We don't have the amount of shadowing that 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 we have with the other one. This maybe means that sound waves are able to penetrate through. It may not be as mature as it looks. I don't know, but, but it's definitely there and it's large. And the last slide, um, I threw this in there as, as maybe a topic to do at another time, um, ultrasound evaluation of the post-op um, post rotator cuff repairs. Um, this is a patient who is five months post-op who came in with a lot of pain. Um, the measurement you see here is the subdeltoid bursa. It was just bursitis. I mean, he had a lot of bursitis. You see this five and a, you know, five, five millimeter um, bursitis. That's quite a bit. Um, what you see here is the top stitch of, of the suture. We have anchors right here, anchor here. Um, and this, this top stitch is coming over to the, the far distal anchor. This signifies, this identifies the top of the tendon. Okay, so from where I measure from the suture to the, to the um, um, delt, uh, subdelt bursa, that signifies bursal distension. Okay, so this was an intact tendon, but I, I think I wanted to throw this in there because just to point out that um, this is five months. It feels like a long time for people, but look at how yet we don't see all the nice fibrillar patterns yet. Um, this wasn't this wasn't a case where this patient was ahead of the game by any means, but this is a it's, it, for the time. This probably is a healthy tendon um, for what they had done and repaired. Okay, but I just want you to note that the tendon bone interface we still have. So immature tissue laying down. Okay, the tendon has nice volume. There's no real worry that there's been a retear. Um, but we know um, um, we know that it's not healed yet. Okay, so that's um, that's why I wanted to throw that in there, and maybe we can talk about that at another time. But but remember this this type of tendon. Um, uh, Echogenicity represents tendinopathy, really. Okay, so they're gonna have, they're they're still gonna have these signs coming out. And any of you who rehab these know you talk to the patients two or three times a week for a couple, two or three months. I mean, you, you kind of you kind of know it's there, but having the ultrasound is nice to um, quantify um, what the patient's been telling you. Okay, and some resources. Okay. Um, I have links to the AUM musculoskeletal community, um, the ESSR ultrasound guidelines, as well as the AUM guidelines. Um, I have a YouTube channel with with some um, with some instructional videos, as well as a website with some instructional videos. I have my email here um, for any of you who have questions um, regarding today's lecture or anything regarding ultrasound. Um, I'm open to that. Um, ultrasoundcases.info is a great resource with lots of case studies. I use it all the time. Um, and Don Buford, um, he's an orthopedic surgeon and RMSK out of Dallas who um, utilizes ultrasound in his practice, practice a lot. He has a great YouTube channel with a ton of content. I recommend you check it out. Um, that is, that concludes the talk. So we got a few minutes for questions. Darcy, I mean, uh, yeah, we have questions. Uh -huh. are, <laughs> are you able to see them at all, or? Yeah, let me let me see if I can pull them down here. Or I can um, read. Them. Maybe if you can read them, I okay. I'm kind of okay. having a hard time reading all the text here. I can't uh, make the slide. I can't read it. In, I can't read it in its entirety. No, that's fine. So here we go. Um, what physical maneuver do you have 
uh, patients do to assess, oh gosh, I can't pronounce this, supraspinosis activity? Do they stay in crass position or move elbow laterally? So to assess the supraspinatus position? That's it, yes, thank you. Um, typically, typically two things. Um, with the patient in crass or semi-crass position, um, I'll, I will passively have assist the patient with ab, AB, abduction and just watch the humerus move and the fibers move with it, okay? And then if you're still not satisfied with that, you can elicit an isometric contraction um, with your hand on the patient's elbow of abduction and, and steady your probe and look for any tears that may elicit with that contraction. I hope that answers the question. I think that's what the question was. Yeah, that I, I believe, well, I believe so. Um, and we do have a comment more than a question from a radiologist that um, when the rotator cuff gets fatty infiltrated, it gets hyper echoic on ultrasound, not hypo echoic. So we've got that clarification. And then here we go on the post-op super spino, spinatus. What is the hyperechoic circle at the prox part of the bursa? Let's see, let's go back to it. This, this may be a fluid pocket. I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll start the question there, I don't know. Um, if you see dark on the ultrasound and clearly this does not appear to be part of the tendon, this is probably some uh, bursal um, effusion that we're seeing there corresponding with what we see over here. This is more in line with fluid as opposed to thickened um, bursts, uh, uh, peribursal fat thickening. That's my that's my best guess. <laughs> okay. Which is, one, which is that one picture. I mean, I had plenty more. No, actually, that wasn't the focus heard... of, that, of that talk, but that's a good, that's a good question. Um, my guess would be that, that that's bursal fluid. And we have a what range of thickness is the supraspinatus supposed to be? Um, well, I, it, it's in the slides. Um, the, the, the ranges have been reported from four millimeters to 6.9 as being like normal. I think, I think the median is six millimeters. Okay. And then um, going back to your slides, what is the hyperechoic area in the last slide post-op supraspinatus? Well, there's a few hyperechoic areas. Um, the one, the one most superficially, yeah. so this is would be the anterior lateral deltoid. Um, this is represents the peribursal fat line of the self deltoid bursa, and this is probably what they're talking about. This is a stitch or a suture that is. Um, this is the top stitch that signifies um, the the top or the superficial edge of of the rotator cuff, the new rotator cuff tendon, and this stitch is headed towards the distal anchor where I'm, where I'm making the circle here. That's what I believe the question is asking and that's what it is. Okay, and we've got, um, do you use PRP or stem cells treatment for these tears? Positive results here? Um, I will say yes. Uh, I'm, I'm affiliated with a, with a group um, that does a lot of PRP and stem cell injections. Um, I don't want to get that's kind of a whole separate talk, and that 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 kind of elicits a, a big, a lot more questions. But I would say yes, and and the results are fairly good if you choose the right patients. I would say we're in the 80 plus percent with the rotator cuff success okay. rate. All right, and um, ooh, hold on a second. They're bouncing around. How to evaluate? Impingement by ultrasound examination, or how do you evaluate impingement? There's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, um, so if you look at the view we have here, this is a coronal view. If I were to slide the probe over and, and move the acromion in, um, actually, this move to there's a picture from the ESSR guidelines that talk, that shows it pretty good. Um, so if you were to acquire this picture with the acromion in the in the supraspinatus, um, you can either have the patient actively or you can passively abduct the elbow and the shoulder and watch this bursa slide underneath the acromion 
okay, if the bursa slides really nicely, then then there's not there's not the there's not a high suspicion for bursitis or, or impingement. But if you see this, you see the humeral head, the complex itself, the humeral complex, rotator cuff complex, kind of migrate up in a, in a butt. The uh, acromion, you you'll get some um, you you might get some blotment of bursal fluid here, or you'll see the bursa itself, this hyperechoic periversal line butt up against there. That's that's definitely one way to um, evaluate impingement. You can also um, look at the coracoacromial ligament and do some um, do some of your um, manual testing from there, like um, Hawkins Kennedy or um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to run through quickly here, um, like a modified uh, yokums or a cross arm adduction and, and, and a yokums in that view, um, and, and look for um, thickening, abutment, bowing of the coracoacromial ligament. Those are signs that are all consistent with impingement. Um, really, you're going to see bowing, if you elicit enough, you'll see bowing on a healthy coracoacromial ligament. But if it replicates that patient's complaint, their primary complaint, then you can be fairly confident of in, uh, compressive impingement syndrome. Okay. Well, we're going to have to um, stop it there. But thank you very much, Dr. Rigney. And on behalf of the AIUM and the APTA, our thanks to all of you who participated in today's webinar. Please complete the activity evaluation and remember to visit the CME Center on our website for the post-test. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and will join us again for future webinars. So long, everyone.